Scrambled Egg Super by Dr. Zeus. Illustrations by Dr. Zeus. I don't like to brag and I don't like to boast, said Peter T. Hooper. But speaking of toast and speaking of kitchens and ketchups and cake and kettles and stoves and the stuff people bake, well, I don't like to brag, but I'm telling you, Liz, that speaking of cooks, I'm the best that there is. Why? Only last Tuesday, when Mother was out, I really cooked something worth talking about. You see, I was sitting here resting my legs and I happened to pick up a couple of eggs and I sort of got thinking, it's sort of a shame, that scrambled eggs always taste always the same. And that's because ever since goodness knows when, they've always been made from eggs of a hen. Just a plain common hen. What a dumb thing to use. With all of the other fine eggs you could choose. And so I decided that just for a change, I'd scramble a new kind of egg on the range. Some fine fancy eggs that no other cook cooks. Like the eggs of a ruffle neck salamangooks. A salamat gooks. Say, they should be good. So I went out and found some as quick as I could. And while I was lugging them back to the house, I happened to notice a tizzletop grouse in a tree down the street. And I knew from her looks that her egg and the egg of a salamangooks gooks ought to mix mightily well, ought to taste simply super when scrambled together by Peter T. Hooper. So I took the eggs home and fizzled them up and I added some sugar, two thirds of a cup and a small pinch of pepper and also a pound of horseradish sauce that was sitting around and also some nuts. Then I tasted the stuff and it tasted quite fine but not quite fine enough. To make the best gramble that's ever been made a cook has to hook the best eggs ever laid. So I drove to the country, quite rather far out, and I studied the birds that were flitting about. I looked with great care at a mop-noodled finch, and I looked at a beagled beak bald-headed grinch, and also I looked at a shade-roosted quail, who was roosting right under a lassalax tail, and I looked at a spritz and a fennel wing jay, but I just didn't stop, I kept right on my way, because they didn't have eggs, they weren't laying that day. Then suddenly, boy, up on that hill a short space, birds, they were laying all over the place. Great happy gay families with uncles and cousins, all laying fine strictly fresh eggs by the dozens. Why, I'll have a scramble more super than super. Scrambled egg super de duper de booper, special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. I picked out the eggs in a most careful way. I only picked those that I knew were grade A. I only took eggs from the very best fowls, so I didn't take eggs from the twiddler owls, because I knew that the eggs of these fellows who twiddle taste sort of like dust from inside a bass fiddle. <sighs> I went for the kind that were mellow and sweet and the world's sweetest eggs are the eggs of the queet. Oh. <laughs> which is due to those very sweet <laughs> trout that they eat. And those trout, well, they're sweet because they only eat wogs. And wogs, after all, are the world's sweetest frogs. And the reason they're sweet whenever they lunch it's always the world's sweetest bees that they munch. And the reason no bees can be sweeter than these, they only eat blossoms of the basil nut trees. And the basil nut blossoms are sweeter than sweet. And that's why I nabbed several eggs from the queet. But I passed up the eggs of a bird called the strudel, who's sort of a stork, but with fur like a poodle. For they say that the eggs of this kind of stalk are gooey like glue and they stick to your fork. And the yolks of these eggs, I am told, taste like fleece, while the whites taste like very old bicycle grease. The places I hiked to, the roads that I rambled, to find the best eggs that have ever been scrambled. I hunted new birds along wide tangled trails, 
through gullies and gulches, down dingles and dales. I wriggled my way and I crawled at a creep through a forest of ferns that were forty miles deep and I mushed through the bush till I found a fine quigger whose eggs are as big as a pinhead, no bigger. Then I went for the eggs of a long legger quong. Now this quong, well, she's built just a little bit wrong for her legs are so terribly, terribly long that she has to lay eggs 20 feet in the air and they drop with a plop to the ground from up there. So unless you can catch them before the eggs crash, you haven't got eggs, you've got long legger hash. Eggs! I'd collected 302, but I still needed more and I suddenly knew that the job was too big for one fellow to do. So I telegraphed north to some friends near Far Zol, which is 10 miles or so just beyond the North Pole. And they all of them jumped in the Kataman side, which is sort of a boat made of a sea leopard's hide, which they sailed out to sea to go looking for grice, which is sort of a bird which lays eggs on the ice, which they grabbed with a tool which is known as a squitch, because those eggs are too cold to be touched without which. And while they were sending those eggs, I got word of a bird that does something almost unheard of. It's hard to believe, but this bird's called the pelf, lays eggs that are three times as big as herself. How that pelf ever learned such a difficult trick, I never found out. But I found that egg quick, and I managed to get it down out of the nest and home to the kitchen along with the rest. But I didn't stop then, because I knew of some ducks, by the name of the single file Zalaman Zucks, who stroll single file through the mountains of Zums, quite oddly though, with their eggs on their thumbs. And some fellows in Zums who I happen to know just happened to capture a thousand or so. And they wrapped up their eggs and then mailed them by air, mark special delivery, handle with care. I needed more helpers, and so for assistance, I called up my fellow named Ali, long distance. And Ali, as soon as he hung up the phone, picked up a small basket and started alone to climb the steep crags and the jags of Mount Struku to fetch me the egg of the Mount Struku cuckoo. Now the Mount Struku cuckoos are rather small gals, but these Mount Struku cuckoos have lots of big pals. They dive from the skies with wild crackling shrieks and they jabbed at his legs and they stabbed at his cheeks with their yammering, clamouring, hammering beaks. But Ali, brave Ali, he fought his way through and he sent me that egg as I knew he would do. For my scrambled egg super de duper de booper special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. In the meanwhile, of course, I was keeping real busy collecting the eggs of the three eyelash tizzy. They're quite hard to reach, so I rode to the top of a ham hicker schlimnicker schnamnicker schnop. Then I found a great flock of southwest facing cranes, and I guess they've got something that's wrong with their brains. For this type of crane, when she's guarding her nest, will always stand facing precisely southwest. So to get at those eggs wasn't hard at the least. I came from behind, from precisely northeast. And I captured the egg of a grickly gractus, who lays them up high on a prickly cactus. Then I went for some ziffs. They're exactly like zaffs, but the ziffs live on cliffs and the zaffs live on bluffs. And, seeing how bluffs are exactly like cliffs, it's mighty hard telling the zaffs from the ziffs. But I know that the egg that I got from the bluffs, if it wasn't a ziffs from the cliffs, was a zaffs. Now I needed the egg of a moth-watching sneth, who's a bird who's so big she scares people to death. And this awful big bird, well, the reason they name her the moth-watching sneth is because that's how they tame her. She likes watching moths, sort of quiets her mind. And while she is watching, you sneak up behind. And you yank out her egg. 
So I got some, of course, with the help of some friends and a very fast horse. If you want to get eggs you can't buy at a store, you have to do things never thought of before. Why, to get at the egg of one very small doff, we had to pry all of one mountain top off. Then I heard of some birds who lay eggs, if you please, that taste like the air in the holes of Swiss cheese. And they live in big Zinzibar Zanzibar trees. So I ordered a treeful. The job was immense. But I needed those eggs and said hang the expense. I still needed more and I saved it for last. The egg of the frightful bombastic aghast. And that bird is so mean and that bird is so fast that I had to escape on a jill jigger jast. A fleet footing beast who can run like a deer, but sort of looks different, you steer him by ear. All through with the searching, all through with the looking, I had all I needed and now for the cooking. I rushed to the kitchen, the place where I stacked them. I rolled up my sleeves, I unpacked them and cracked them and shucked them and chucked them in 95 pens. Then I mixed in some beans, I used 55 cans. Then I mixed in some ginger, nine prunes and three figs. And parsley, quite sparsely, just 22 sprigs. Then I added six cinnamon sticks and a clove and my scramble was ready to go on the stove. And you know how they tasted? They tasted just like, well, they tasted exactly, exactly just like like scrambled eggs, super de duper de booper, special deluxe, a la pita T. Hooper.